Okay, well, let's start. And first of all, welcome. It, it's just so lovely to see you all. Of course, we wish we were in Bologna, but I've just come back from doing the Haylittery Festival digitally. And, you know, you can make very exciting things digitally and you can reach people who you would not be able to reach otherwise. So we came out of our 10 days feeling we're longing to get back to authors being right in front of children and making that direct connection. But we're also thinking, what of this, this last 15 months in terms of technology we can take on and where it could be useful, particularly for audiences who we haven't previously done so well to reach. So, mm. you know, there's some, um, I, I, I hate being Pollyanna-ish about this, but there are some things that can be quite um, positive about it. And uh, we were very excited by you authors, uh, in, in this case, the ones who were coming to Hay, but authors in general with their, and why would I be surprised? Authors are creative, but the way you've all had to be so creative in thinking about how to present yourselves, how to present children's books, how to present reading in this, this different form. So yeah, I feel very inspired about it. And um, I think what you're all doing is part of that same pattern. You had to adapt very quickly and, and you have. And what's so exciting is to see the Children's Laureate program thriving um, in this new way. Now we chose a kind of pretty big umbrella theme. And I think the point about today is for us to hear from each of you about what you've been doing and what you think is working well, what your hopes are. Um, and also to bear in mind, when we first got the Children's Laureates together in Bologna, one of the points of it was to use it as a way of encouraging countries who hadn't yet um, managed to set up a Children's Laureate scheme or ambassador scheme or whatever we call it. Um, and so the great thing about having this as a, as a recorded event is that we'll, that will be in the, um, in the Bologna um, back packet, pocket as it were, and they can use it, continue to use it because some of you may know my ambition has, has long been that we, we in, spread this idea and this program as far as possible and we get it into countries which have only an emerging literacy who aren't as established in the traditions of libraries and author tours and all the things that you've been brought up with probably on a, on a certainly developing because I think you know a bit like having to get global vaccination to make the world well you have to have global reading to really crack the problems of literacy it's no good saying we can do it in some countries but not in others that's not an answer so today seems to me a fantastic opportunity for that so as I said in my email I think we'll start with um Ursula, partly just because Australia comes first. Um, it's very exciting to hear you're traveling because we feel that Australia is now not only a very long way away, but also a country that's going to be really hard to ever get into again. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad you can at least travel around it. So perhaps you could start by telling us what you've been doing and what your hopes are and how you're, you're thinking about this broad, interpret any way you like. There is no rules on this one. Oh, well, look, thank you. And it's, it is it um, is really fantastic to see all your faces and to be able to, to meet uh, in this way. And yes, I, I am able to travel a little bit and talk to children in schools and we're not even wearing masks. So um, uh, we have to check in, but otherwise it's in New South Wales at any rate at the moment, it's pretty free. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. I'll introduce you to the Laureate Magpie. I'm not sure if uh, you might be wondering why I've got this bird all the time, but we have a mascot for our Laureate. It's something for the children obviously to relate to and I take it with me. And when I talk, I usually have it next to me and it's a you know, ubiquitous Australian bird with a beautiful voice and um, uh, some more difficult sweeping habits, but a very well-known bird and, and a bird held in affection um, and a protector of its young. So I suppose that's that's a, a good kind of mascot. Um, and behind me, I've got the couple of posters that were the calendar that we've used for um, my laureate ship. And like all of you, I had to, you know, come up with a a kind of a, a project or a mission or a slogan. And mine was, as I think we've discussed before, read for your life in the sense of, um, you know, read to enrich and empower and perhaps save your life. 
but also a sense that uh, an you, what we want is to encourage children to identify themselves as readers, that, that for their whole life they'll feel that they are a reader, you know, that um, it's not just something that they learned to do at school and then forgot about, but they think of themselves as a reader and a reader um, for life. And in connection with that, I suppose I started to think, you know, about how I became a reader. And obviously I learned to read at school, but probably like um, a number of people listening to this, a great number maybe even, I learned to love to read in the library, either the school library or the local library. And um, that is absolutely where I learned to, to, to be a reader and identify as a reader. And that's why I, the, the sort of one of the chief missions of our program was to encourage children to join their local library, to actually get their own library card. And um, we, on the um, idea of my publisher, actually, Alan and Umwen, they thought of having a special laureate library card, which they designed using uh, the illustrations from, we have two illustrators associated in a sort of official capacity with the laureate, and they provide a lot of illustration for all the things that we put out to make them engaging and in attractive to children. One is Toby Riddle and one is Andrew Joyner. And uh, there's a library card which features each of their illustrations. And this particular one is from the library system in Canberra, where they made the Laureate Library Card a, a the sort of cheap feature of their program. They had a 12-week program to encourage children from the age of not to five to join their local library, actually get their own library card. So that it's almost, you know, the, the first piece of officialdom you have after your birth certificate and you know I am a reader so that that's um has, has been a, a a kind of major focus and of course my great plan was to you know roam around the country waving library cards at children and telling them to join the library uh which of course didn't happen because of uh COVID um but as we were just we've discussed before and you were just saying now Julia and we were talking a little before that the the rupture to our plans in some ways, I suppose, kind of pushed us into being a lot more imaginative um, about the use of digital culture and the quite remarkable things it can achieve. And the intimacy and enthusiasm and, and knowledge that it can spread. And so we had to use it, so we did use it. And I'm sure like all of the other children's laureates and ambassadors, there's been an awful lot of Zooming and recording of videos and talking and, and creating of digital materials um, for children and adults to, to um, access and, and use. And um, as a result, as we were saying, you reach new audiences, you reach people you never could have reached. Australia, mm -hmm. as you all know, is this great lump of a thing it's a long way to get places and it's expensive, very expensive to travel as well. So in a sense, we've been able to reach all sorts of people and places that we otherwise wouldn't have. And within that, we very much as part of the plan, and this has continued digitally and in person, we have wanted to make a strong relationship with each state library of each state and territory. Australia is almost you know, like six or seven or eight little separate countries and they each have their own established institutions and you have to develop all those relationships. And so we were very keen to develop relationships with every state and territory library service and also with the children's commissioners who each state and territory has a, it's a public service position that is there to advocate for the rights of children in all sorts of circumstances, you know, legally, socially, everything. And so we've wanted in that way to uh, make relationships with the children's commissioners. And also we're just starting to work behind the scenes to, to connect with the state justice departments. So the, because obviously children come through the justice system either themselves or with their families or a, a relative that is connected with the justice system. And it's such a fantastic sort of opportunity that we would hope that we could bring some of um, what we believe in um, in, in, as, in working for the Laureate to those children as well. As I said, we've done a lot of electronic resources on the website, writing activities, all beautifully illustrated by Toby and Andrew, writing activities, reading activities, drawing activities. Uh, we've had a playwriting competition. We're going to have a, 
a magpie drawing competition, um, you know, and of course videos and all those sorts of things. And the very last thing um, I'll tell you about is, um, um, which is something that makes is, is a good feeling because it's a kind of legacy for the future. Because of course, you know, I'm only the laureate till November and then off I fly into the sunset. Um, but in the shape of this book, which you can see, which is called The March of the Ants, and it's got a little laureate um, symbol on the front. Um, it's a, a kind of item that will remain after I've disappeared. And it started its life uh, when I was appointed the Australian Children's Laureate. We had a kind of a, a ceremony in Canberra. This was before COVID, mainly children in the audience at the National Library of Australia. And I thought I was given 10 minutes to give a speech. And I thought, well, look, you know, blah, blah, blah. They, children, understandably, on formal occasions, don't necessarily listen to all the beautiful lofty things I might have to say. So I'll, I'll tell them a story and I'll get them up on stage and act the story with me about why I think books are so valuable and reading is, is so vitally important to all our lives. And so I, I wrote a little fable called The March of the Ants. And the idea was that I would roam around the country getting children up on stage and I would read this book about ants going off on an expedition bringing all these extremely important things they must bring, food, water, maps, tools, absolutely fantastic things. And yet there's one little ant who says she wants to bring her book. And all the other ants tell her this is ridiculous, bring something useful, but she clings onto it. I'm bringing my book. And as the story transpires, it's very short, but it becomes very clear to all of the ants in the ant army at a certain point in the expedition how absolutely vital it is to all of them that she brought this book and that's you know the meaning of culture in all our lives and in our instance literary culture so um it wasn't meant to be a book but a publisher book trail press decided to turn it into a book and and it's now a book this year so now as i do manage to come start to travel around australia i've got my book with me and i can read my little fable about the ants so those, I'll stop there. I don't want to take up more time, but those are just some of the things that we've been doing. Um, you know, it's a selection and some of the, I guess, thoughts I've been having as we've been doing it. So um, um, over to the next speaker. Thank you well, for listening. <laughs> well, I get to step in first just to say thank you very much. And um, I, I think we won't have questions of everybody sort of throughout. Let's take everybody's um, opener, yep. as it were, and then thoughts so keep 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 think, writing things down because there are going to be some some themes and some communality as well as some differences but um i loved i just love the buoyancy of what you're talking about and um as i say the idea that you you know you you couldn't travel but you found other things to do you ha it, it doesn't seem to have stopped you in your tracks it's rather broadened <laughs> the way you would reach out and that's you know that's what's exciting so um i think i said next that we'd go to henrika Yes. So perhaps you will tell us what you've been doing in Finland and just give us a tiny bit of background about how your laureate works. Thank you very much. And thank you for having us. I think this is wonderful. And the first time I went to Bologna, actually, I went there as a uh, ambassador also of uh, book laureate, but then, uh, and that was, I think six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And then I was a book laureate making projects. And we worked a lot with refugees coming to Finland afterward, and also with people with different language backgrounds. Uh, and, and these projects were very popular, but then it stopped. And now, uh, hooray, we are two full-time book laureates working for the minority in Finland, the Swedish speaking minority, and we still have one year left. And uh, there was one full-time laureate before us who had the focus of, uh, of trying to inspire children in the age of 10 to 14. So now they left that focus group out from us. So we have two focus group, zero to six year old and 11 to 15. And because there's so much wonderful to tell, I will uh, focus on two projects that we did on this 
Corona, the, the bigger projects, because also I think that for all the ones who have not a laureate yet, or the one who wants to take a project further in other countries, these two has been very successful and good. And the first one uh, was um, something we call man reading, because one of the big, I think big um, issues in every country are the young boys that stopped reading. I think uh, it's a similar problem everywhere. That's what the teachers, the first question we get from the teacher, what will I do with these guys? They don't read. So we can't, uh, and then of course, we have to go to this uh, question about role models. And as we are two women laureates, we cannot turn into guys. Uh, so we made um, a, a film, a short film, uh, with 13 role models, men in Finland, from the Finland's president, Sauli Niinistö, to hairdresser, a doctor, a rap musician, people from very different backgrounds, telling what's the best about reading, why are they reading, how did they find this reading uh, suitable in the private life, but also in the work they do. And also Tim Sparr, for example, very famous, uh, this captain of the Finland football team. And, uh, and trying to, in that way, show that reading is essential. Whatever you work with, it's uh, something you, you, you really win so much. And also these guys were, were telling what would they give to a guy about 13 or 15 years old and also telling what they read now. And we have all these films. We did this with the National uh, Ule, that is our TV uh, channel, the public, public one. So they are out there to anyone. There is one short film uh, on 10 minutes, but there's also all the interviews with each one and also questions to the pupils to uh, if you want to choose one role model, and then you can answer questions around that. And, and it has been showed very much around in schools, but also in other, in other and it's uh, free for, for everyone to access. So this was very, we, we wanted to do it normally, but then COVID came, so we did everything uh, by Zoom, and uh, that was okay. We had a young guy asking the questions. You don't see us at all. It's the young guy, and he is actually very keen on knowing because he's not a reader himself, and it's uh, and it's ending that he's actually sitting and reading, and he got to be a reader that way. Uh, and the other one. Uh, the other project I'd like to, to tell about is what we call a uh, hall library. And there we focus on the parents and also the people working at the daycare, but especially the parents who have a child at daycare, they have a hall library. So when they get to take their children home, they also can borrow a book from the shelf in the hall. It's very easy, very simple, and the, uh, the books are changed every two months, and there are uh, professional librarians who choose the books, so they are uh, looking into diversity and different languages they have at the day, that daycare or themes they work on, and this has made children to be uh, book ambassadors because the children want to read the same books and they are coming in the morning and say, oh, now I want this one. And, and then they start to make plays about them and they talk about them. And also the people who work at daycare can, can take of these books. So it has been a very successful um, way of getting families that normally don't go to the uh, libraries now to have books and, uh, and now it's taking over uh, by itself. So it was a pilot with 12 different around Finland uh, uh, daycares, and now it's starting to move by itself. And it's very easy. 
uh, when you have a concept. The only thing we went and put up shelves and then we had this further education for uh, the, the staff that work at daycare. Mm, that was very important to tell them why this is really for you and please use it and be happy to be in this uh, and not coming from from up and saying you have to but but give it this uh, give it as an, an opportunity and also then having the possibility to talk uh, at the the parents night so we get about maybe half an hour to tell about passionately about the books. And then we give facts by giving uh, bo good books and telling about them and telling sort of more, more also a story about readers and reading, but putting in there underlining also the facts. Uh, so many parents don't know the things that we all know about. I won't tell them for because you know how, how wonderful and important it is. But do, those two has been very good and successful now. Also uh, during the pandemic, the, libra the libraries were closed, but we could still go on with the hall libraries. And that was very good. And also we made um, the possibility that we had a, a big reader competition for everyone in the class of five. All the fifth grade classes were having a competition who is reading the most. And this was, I don't like competitions. I can admit that. But I must say, when you get to see at one Zoom, 1,000 children who together read over 1 million pages. And they were just parents writing to us, what has happened? What have you done to my boy? Usually he comes here home and he wants to play, but now he wants to go to the library and have books. And he's just reading and reading because some people really get very passionate about competitions. They love it. Mm -hmm. and. I mean, all the ways to get people to read and find good books is good. And here the diversity also that we let them read what they wanted on their own level. So there was not like uh, exclusive, some, some literature, you could read mag like sport magazines or what, what you wanted, but you, you were counting the pages <laughs> for one month. So this was very nice also. Um, I love that because I also don't like competitions, but they do have their place. And since I spend a lot of time judging book prizes, it's not really a thing I should say because that's a competition. But yeah. there are ways of bringing books to attention through competitions. There are ways of reaching readers through competitions. So, you know, as a child of the 60s in the non-competitive growing up, uh, mm -hmm. it's anathema to me, but it works. <laughs> yes, and I, I want to say also Amanda Audas Kass is the other ambassador. She, she said hello to everybody. And she is very, very good to have as a laureate because she's a teacher. So she really knows. We, we writers or illustrators, we have one point of view and that's good to be creative and all that, but it's very, very important also to bring in the school reality because she knows all about that. And it's really working very well to be two ambassadors. Yes, I think too, I mean, it's such a big pitch otherwise to, to um, for anyone to cover. I said no questions, but I just want to ask two things because it's going to segue neatly into Anya. And one is, um, you speak of the minority, and that's the Swedish speakers. Are they bilingual? They're presumably bilingual children living in yes. Finland, but... Most of us are bilingual, but the yeah. mother tongue is Swedish. We have 5.5%, yeah. uh, and they're mostly living by the coast, but it's all, they are also small, small parts. So it's very important to strengthen this uh, language. Right. I can't remember the second question already, so that shows it's good not to be asking him. So I'm going to move swiftly on to Anya, who is also uh, working in a community with bilingual readers. So I think that's a very nice, I mean, it's just so interesting, the bits that overlap and the bits that everyone does a little bit different. Anya, can you tell us about your role? I can, and thank you very much, Julia. And uh, I think mine segues very easily 
from Henrika, because I believe passionately that every child, every young person has a right to see themselves in a book, has a right to read in their own language. And I believe that it, literature is a window on a culture and that every child should see their own culture, their own language reflected in a book. And this is central to my focus as laureate. Uh, my, I, I think that I'm, well, I am exclusively writing in Irish. I haven't written for years. I did some journalistic work in English, but as a children's writer, I write exclusively in Irish. We call it Gaelge, Gaelan, Gaelic, whatever term you happen to be familiar with. And my main focus for the laureate has been and is to lift the invisibility cloak off children's literature in Irish and to bring Irish language writing for young people and children into the mainstream conversation. I want children to have access to this, the same access to literature in Irish as they have in English. Now, to give you some background on this very briefly, everyone in Ireland speaks English fluently. For a minority, well, for the majority, English is the first language. For a minority, Irish is the first language. And for part of that minority, Irish is a co-first language where, like my own children, children are brought up bilingually and they speak both English and Irish equally fluently from right from the start. And in Ireland, we also have a huge resurgence of interest in the Irish language over the past 20 years, probably. And we now have 60,000 young people being educated through the medium of Irish. Some of these have Irish at home, some haven't. Some, uh, in some cases, you have people who have moved into Ireland from other cultures who see the value in the, that window on a culture and send their children. Children where they're being, where they are Irish, but perhaps of Nigerian origin, uh, parental Nigerian origin they are now attending an Irish language school. So they speak the language of their parents, they speak Irish and they speak English. And outside of all of this grouping, Irish is then a language you learn. It's a subject in school, an academic subject, and it's a subject for homework, not for pleasure. So my focus is to get people reading in Irish for pleasure, whatever group they come from, whatever background. And there's an amazing range of Irish language books for children and young people, beautifully written, superbly illustrated. And I want to get these into the mainstream conversation. Now, it sounds easy, but it's actually a lot of work. It's a bit like watching the trapeze artist and uh, you're swinging away, but you forget that he had to climb the ladder first. And uh, you know that... Um, well, all, all of you know the powerhouse that is Angela Flannery in the background. And with the pandemic, all of this, while it sounded incredibly difficult, with Angela's work, it all moved very seamlessly online. And one of the first things we did is we set up a campaign. And if you look here, you'll see a little um, lapel pin, Give Laur Gaiga, which means give an Irish language book. And this campaign is to encourage adults to give an Irish language book to a child so that they are encouraging a child to read for pleasure in Irish. So at Christmas, we selected 10 books. We made short videos for social media on these 10 books and uh, we promoted them. And in March, we did the same and we selected another 10 books for Seacht na Gaeilge. And Seacht na Gaeilge is Irish Language Week. It's centered around St. Patrick's Day. And in typical Irish, lang Irish fashion, Irish Language Week now lasts about a month. So um, we pushed another 10 books, selected another 10 books for this. And uh, with that, we made short videos and they went out on, on social media. Now, as part of the Give Laur Gaeilge project, the huge project that I have selected for my laureate term is a Busca Laurlana, which means a library box. And this is a 
a starter library for schools, for every primary school in the country, where they will get a box of 10 Irish language books, sorry, 20 or so Irish language books as a starter library to encourage children to read for pleasure. There'll be one box, one selection for Irish language medium schools where children are already fluent in Irish and can read in Irish, but many of them actually move to English to read for pleasure because of the quantity of books available in English. And uh, there'll be a separate box then for English language schools and uh, a different 20. Probably the focus here will be on a lot of picture books so that children who aren't comfortable or haven't the experience of reading for pleasure are getting the opportunity to start quite simply. And uh, this is huge in terms of funding and the Children's Books Ireland and Laureate team are already working on funding partnerships for this. So it is, it is huge. There's, um, you know, it's a, it, that is the major central part of the fund of the project. Now, as well as all of this, the Laureate Nano term has now been moved to three years in Ireland as a result of a review by the Irish Arts Council. And the Laureate role has changed and developed as a result of all of this. And so now new aspects of the Laureate, aspects that I actually love, I get great joy out of. One of them is a mentoring scheme. And this is a hobby of mine because I've, I, I've loved mentoring writers and I've been doing it in Irish for a number of years. And the mentoring scheme through open competition for writers were selected to under 21 to over 21. They didn't have to be writing in Irish. They could write in English, didn't matter. Um, I'm afraid language wise, we couldn't open it to other languages because of my uh, uh, Irish and English are my two languages. But the, we stipulated that the over 21s must be working on literature for children. The under 21s could be writing absolutely anything. As it happened, and we didn't set out with this as a rule. We were delighted that it happened, but two of those selected are like myself writing in exclusively in Irish and the other two are writing in English. Although one extraordinary young writer, uh, an under 21, who is an amazing poet, she decided to try her hand for the first time in her life at writing bilingually. And her first poem in Irish actually went on to win an award in a national competition. So it's, it's <coughs> lovely to see her moving into the possibility of bilingual writing. Now, each of the four mentees gets four sessions, and the first two are now just coming to a close. And uh, while there's a lot of work in this, I spent the last three days reading 17 chapters of a novel for one writer and trying to prepare mentoring for that in the next few days. But it's hugely, hugely rewarding. And it's wonderful to work with adults as well as with children. And another new aspect of the Laureate term is the, the, the Laureate lecture, which will now be an annual event. And again, very enjoyable. The first one was delivered online to a camera in an empty room and went onto the Arts Council website. Hopefully the next one will be in front of a live audience. But while the pandemic has limited us all in many ways, there have been many drawbacks. There have also been huge benefits because we've all learned to move online and we can now access, as Ursula said earlier, we're able to get to an audience that we mightn't have got to before through Zoom. And uh, we've all adapted to the new possibilities of technology. And I've been face to face with children in a classroom only once in the past year. I'm really looking forward to actually being face to face with children off Zoom, not on screen a lot in the next two years. I'm excited about that. And I just hope that we'll all see one another as well face to face. Mm -hmm. And I hope that in the next year or two, that the world will be a more open and a better place and that we'll all be able to bring all of our projects to fruition more easily. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for such a sort of very full report. And 
I was going to ask you, but you kind of almost <laughs> answered it, um, and we'll get back to it. Are you pushing water uphill when you said what a lot of work it was? <laughs> um, it's a very ambitious program. It's very ambitious, but if you're passionate about something, it's worth it. Mm. So I don't think we're pushing water uphill. I think financially we're probably pushing pushing up water uphill. But in terms of enthusiasm and response to the project from Irish language writers, from bookshops, one of our mainstream bookshops has now agreed to take on the Laureate Choice. And this is huge because the big bookshops in Ireland were not stocking a, a wide range of Irish language books, and now they are. So we have a lot of help. If we're pushing water upstream, we have a lot of people pushing the boat. That's all right. You need a team. Um, Bagheer, uh, very nice to meet you. We, we've never met before, and um, I'm sorry, it's this way, we're not in Bologna, but we will all meet. And perhaps you'd like to uh, talk to us about the work that you've been doing in your time as, I'm not sure whether you're called the laureate or an ambassador. Ambassador. Thank you very ambassador. much for, for having me. Very nice to see you, at least at Zoom, and hope to see you all soon uh, in life as well. Um, I'm one of 100,000 Roma people in Sweden. Uh, the Roma people have been in Sweden since 1512 and are now considered a part of Sweden. And we have gained minority status and privileges. We now have the right to our language, culture, and have the right to decide in matters that concern us. And we work towards equal rights for the Roma people in Sweden. And in a effort to combat anti-Tsiganism, as it's called. Uh, the Swedish government has strengthened the minority laws in Sweden in 2019. And in 2020, I was appointed as Sweden's fifth reading ambassador and the first one of uh, Roma mm. descent. And uh, during my time as a reading ambassador, I focused on three main goals here in Sweden. The first one is I have written a, a blog about Roma authors on the page of Sweden's Cultural Council to awaken the curiosity of, of, of uh, Roma authors uh, to the majority of Sweden to discover them. Uh, there are Roma authors uh, all around the, the, the world. And uh, I've also done this not only for the majority of the people in Sweden, but also for the Roma themselves because uh, it was not possible to find uh, the Roma authors uh, gathered in one place. So it was very important for me to, to, to let uh, the majority discover the Roma authors, but also uh, for the Roma themselves. And especially important was it for the, for the Roma youth so they can uh, discover a different part of the Roma identity and to help them to inspire to dream and find some positive role models in a world full of uh, negative stereotypes uh, about my people. Uh, my second goal was aimed especially towards the Roma people who have a, a oral tradition and do not write down the traditional stories that pass from generation to generation. And it's a beautiful tradition and the Roma uh, storytellers are some of the most amazing storytellers in the world but it's a fragile tradition uh, that is sensitive to time and to catastrophes that seem to come upon my people throughout our history. For example, during the Roma Holocaust, during World War II, where we lost a lot of our oral history and cultural bears. So my main objective was to help encourage the younger generation to write down the older generations life stories, fairy tales, and old Roma legends and myths so we can preserve them for the future generation and also to uh, stimulate to publish more books written and told about the Roma people uh, by themselves. Uh, my third goal was aimed at the public libraries here in Sweden. As I mentioned earlier, the Swedish government has strengthened the minority laws in Sweden and urge the public libraries to help lift up the minority literatures in, in the libraries. And for me, the libraries is the most 
democratic and welcoming place in the world where where anyone is welcome and uh, that's without regards of your origin so in an effort to make them even more inclusive and to help them fulfill the new minority laws uh, they were able to uh, seek uh, uh, to become a roma reading embassy and the response i must say was incredibly positive we have appointed 32 roaming uh, Roma reading ambassadors embassies around all of Sweden. Uh, they get a diploma for being our embassies and making Roma literature more accessible. They lift it up and make it more visible when you enter the public libraries. And that makes the public uh, <clears throat> more curious to know about the Roma people and also makes the Roma children and the Roma people feeling uh, incredibly par uh, proud of being part of the most democratic place on earth, our public libraries. Uh, of course, we have different Roma groups here in Sweden, and not all of the Roma groups have been able to, to go to, to attend school. Uh, the Roma had the right to attend school here in Sweden in the late 50s, early 60s. So we have an entire generation of Roma population here in Sweden that never went to school and, and uh, didn't learn how to write. So we also made uh, short films uh, where we speak in Romanes in the importance of picking up a book uh, to your children at a very young age and telling stories with help of the pictures uh, in, the, in the books if, if you aren't able to write. So we talk about uh, how important it is for very young children, a uh, little bit older children, and, and of course for, for teenagers as well, how important it is to, to be able to read and to uh, uh, have books around them uh, from very young age. Uh, so that's a, that has been the main objectives uh, during my time as a reading ambassador in Sweden. Uh, uh, towards both minority and uh, uh, majority here in Sweden. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's uh, I, my the hairs on the back of my neck are tingling. I think we've got so many things here, so many strands, and what's so interesting. You all think you're doing completely different jobs, but when we kind of look at the weave underneath, there's such a passionate commitment to the same ends that, in fact, you're all in different ways covering the, the same sort of bases. Um, I think the thing that's come out today that we never have had in a discussion with the children's laureates is this uh, encouragement of uh, groups who haven't been reading in their own language. And I think this is a new thing and I'm sure it will spread. And I'm sure in countries that haven't begun to address this, they will because, and that's a very positive force that we're empowering children in their own cultures. And that can only be, well, I find that a very exciting thing to be thinking about. Um, and I mean, I'm an I'm a Anglo-Saxon with only one language, but um, just hearing people talking about operating in two languages and what that means. I wondered um, if we could quickly have a look at libraries in each of your countries, because everybody is working with libraries in, in one way or another. In general, are libraries, uh, flourishing and uh, progressive. Is there a, anybody like to give me a thought about what libraries in their country are doing and how they're funded? Now we can don't go into the detail, but just in general sense, are libraries flourishing? Um, I think the municipal libraries in Australia are very well supported. I think there would have been a period when they would have thought libraries were on the way out, but they've had a resurgence and the the sort of flagship building of many municipalities is now the library rather than the town hall that's that's where mm. they spend the money on architecture and that's what they're proud of and that's where they want people to come school libraries are a very different situation uh, very um very very varied as to whether a school will or won't have a library or and even if they have a library i mean it's sort of seems incredible when clearly the fundamental responsibility of, of a primary school or any school is, is to create uh, good, competent 
readers that they seem to feel you can have a school without a library. And exactly as Andrew was saying, you need people to want to uh, enjoy reading. If they're going to read a lot, they have to take pleasure in reading. Mm. So it's not just a, a support of the curriculum, a library. That's what seems not to be understood. But in terms of municipal libraries and um, state libraries, I think they're, they're, um, they're in, in a good, good shape at the moment. In Australia, I, I just want to oh, say sorry. that obviously. No, I was just going to say that Australia, obviously, um, what everybody is saying about um, languages is is uh, you know deep importance in Australia, particularly in relation to Indigenous languages. Mm. And I'm quite sure, as you say, Julia, the future laureates that is going to be a very significant element of what the laureate is going to work towards, which it hasn't so far, but I'm sure it is going. To Henrika, you wanted to say something about uh, libraries. Yes, I do agree. Libraries are, are the most fantastic things we have and, and that everyone can access them. And they're working very well in Finland. And, uh, and uh, the problem is maybe that they are, are diminishing the small li libraries on, uh, on the countryside. Mm -hmm. We also have had libraries in bo uh, like uh, uh, cars, library cars coming. Um, mm. And that's very good, but but it's all a question about what you, uh, what's your priority on on a very high level. What what are they deciding, and who is taking care of that? And what I wanted to say that one thing that we are very aware and focus on, uh, also as a, a laureate, book ambassadors, is to make to connect people to each other. Mm -hmm because there is a gap between the librarian and the schools or the, the daycare in many small places. Mm -hmm. So we have actually a big, uh, big project regarding almost uh, the whole of Finland, because we are not so many on, in a country, so we, we need to make these connections and, and uh, starting to find one one person in every uh, community that is the the spider in that community taking care that the librarian and the teachers and daycare people have also work time to meet because mm -hmm. usually the problem is that you you think that it's only the passionate people that doing on the free time uh, and uh, really see the necessity but it should be on a level that you should have some time for, for the librarian and for the teachers and headmasters in school to make the connection because it's so valuable. And when it's working, it's very good because we in Finland, we don't have the obligation that every school has an own library like in, in Sweden. Uh, here, the connection is really, really important. Um, Anya and then begin. Yes. I, I think that in Ireland we have fantastic libraries and we have fantastic school libraries. But in terms of the school ones, I think the difficulty can sometimes be that it's all very dependent on the head teacher in a school or an individual teacher in a school. Mm -hmm. If you have one person who is passionate about reading, you'll find that the school has a library. You'll walk into certain classes and certain classrooms have their own library where a teacher actually creates a library. And I remember one teacher when my own children were young, I remember one particular teacher who suggested that every child bring in one book and they created this small little classroom library of 30 books. And it beca people became so fascinated by it that parents and children started to donate more books because they suddenly realized that this gave them access to another 30 books they hadn't read before. The, mm. the uh, difficulty I find with libraries in Ireland is that we still haven't enough. Now, I know there's huge efforts being made, but we still haven't enough diversity of language and culture in libraries. And when Owen was talking earlier, you know, I just to mention it here behind me, I have this wonderful book called When the Moon Travels and uh, or Why the Moon Travels. And it this 
to me, is one of the most wonderful books that has come out because it's a book of diversity. It's a book of stories uh, of Ireland's travelling community. And it's written by Owen de Vardun, and uh, it actually won two awards recently at the Children's Books Ireland KPMG Book Awards. And this is the type of book that I would like to see getting into every library in the country so that children's exposure to a variety of culture, variety of language is increased all the time through libraries, whether it's the public library or a school library, that we, we as yet, we're moving there, but as yet we haven't enough diversity in our libraries. Bagheer, would that be true in Sweden as well? That you have, I know you have wonderful libraries. Yes, in Sweden we have a very vibrant uh, uh, life in the in the libraries, in the public libraries, and there's always full of people. Of course, during the pandemic, it's been a little bit different, but almost all the schools have their own libraries, and we have uh, very beautiful public libraries. And in Sweden, there's a a, a lot of financial effort towards updating the, the libraries, uh, building new ones. And the Royal Library here in Sweden has put in a, a lot of time and effort and money to, to update the libraries. And, and the libraries are, are absolutely wonderful places to be in. Uh, mm. Lots of people, I've worked in the library for a couple of years myself, and it was wonderful to see children coming in with their parents, uh, school children coming in, studying in study rooms and uh, playing cards and, and, and lending uh, books. And also oh, it's very nice to see uh, older gentlemen sitting together playing chess and discussing politics and reading newspapers. So I think uh, the library scene here in Sweden is very much alive and they, they put a lot of effort into the libraries. I'm listening with huge envy. I can't say I think the libraries in, in the UK are, uh, or, or in England are flourishing like that. And I think, I mean, I suppose the difficulty is the, the um, well, in schools, uh, it's, I, I totally agree with Anya, it depends on one person being very passionate about it. Um, but what's so curious is the, um, I suppose I've always found it curious, but I don't get any less curious about how it is that so few people know anything about children's books. I mean, you know, so many teachers, uh, so many parents, and it, it just have no idea. They can kind of dredge up a book from their childhood. But if you ask them about contemporary authors or illustrators, these are people who would expect to know about contemporary adult authors. And I just wonder why it is that we feel it's okay to let slip out of our minds what children might be reading and don't realize that what they read is their window in the world and is going to inform them and take them out and expand but we all know that so i shouldn't really be surprised by that but it's very i mean what is it what's so interesting is that i think you all are working closely with libraries and are obviously supported by them in, in different ways according to um what, what's going on your in your country and you're also uh, all pulling together these ideas about every find every child finding themselves in the book and and um, ways in which you can um, access that and unlock that and give them the experience of becoming engaged and exciting readers and I don't I don't really need to ask you because I can tell from how passionate you all are about what you're doing however tough the role is and I know it's hard work I think you're all enjoying it a lot. And I feel in your times as laureate, you've all changed the scenery again. And sometimes I feel we should put all the screens together of the new look, the new approaches towards children and reading, the new initiatives, the new ways of reaching out, not only to, not only to people who haven't been reached out to before, but also to children who have been reached out to, but haven't quite you know, made the connection or to adults who haven't made the connection. And Rika talked about the importance of the whole libraries and the ways that parents need to be connected back into being able to choose a book with confidence because someone in the school has put it in. And it's all about building these communities together. And I think all I'd really like to end with is saying thank you all of you for the fantastic contribution you're making. And you know, one day let's look back and see where we were when the Children's Laureates were started out 
and where we've got to and the blue skies to which we're heading because I think this is a fantastic initiative and it's just such a wonderful thing to be able to share views about reading, ways of engaging children, ways of thinking about different languages, different cultures, bringing back an oral tradition and bringing back here, the point about a culture which has an oral tradition and how do we capture that is absolutely wonderful and please let's keep this conversation going. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to the Bologna Children's Book Fair for managing this. In particular, thank you to Angela Flannery, uh, who has orchestrated, organized, kept us on our toes and given us this wonderful opportunity. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.